Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar called Future You, Making Choices Today to Ensure Success Tomorrow. My name is Ruby Woodside. I'm the Innovative Services Manager at Second Nature. Uh, next slide. So I'd just like to briefly introduce our presenters today. Um, I'm excited to be joined by Fred Rogers, who is the Vice President and CFO of Carleton College in Minnesota. Uh, Carleton, Fred oversees all financial and business operations of the college. Uh, we are also joined today by David Damian, who is the President and CEO of Greener U, a company that he co-founded in 2009. Greener U is a mission-driven company that helps higher ed institutions fight climate change through energy efficiency, engineering, and change management strategies. Next slide. So just a brief overview for what we will discuss today. Um, first of all, we'll hear a case study of utility and infrastructure planning on campus at Carleton. Then we'll hear from David on how Greener U helps schools uh, make decisions about energy efficiency and construction projects on campus, including a case study from uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And then finally, we'll leave some time for questions and answers. Um, at any time during the webinar, you can send us questions using the questions feature in the chat box. Um, this should be in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And then also um, just letting folks know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website afterwards. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Fred. Thank you. Hello, my name is Fred Rogers. And as was noted, I'm at Carleton College, which is a small liberal arts college. If we can go to the next slide, um, two slides, one more. There we are in Minnesota. Um, the discussion today is gonna be about the uh, long-term nature of uh, planning and choices in campus infrastructure planning. Much of what I'm going to talk about was also the subject of an article in the Nakubo Business Officer in May of 2016, about a year ago. So if you have a way to look back at that, you could also read more about this compared to some other campuses there. Um, my basic point is to illustrate the long-term nature of this kind of planning and the choices that are involved in campus infrastructure planning and the long-term impacts that they have. I believe that energy and sustainability issues should not be addressed as competitors to the resources to support the mission, but rather sustainability investments should enhance and strengthen the mission and capacity of the institution. Um, the next slide. The technologies that I want to talk about are uh, not super exciting. Um, and uh, we're actually on the next slide, I think. There we go. Um, High pressure steam and electricity will be two of the main things I'll be talking about today. The planning and investment choices are long term and their impact uh, is on the long term college future. I believe that most campuses can figure out where they have opportunities that are maybe not the same as but similar to the things we'll talk about. And it's incumbent on each of us to pursue the opportunities most germane to our own circumstance. This requires patience, persistence and clear analytics and communication. Synergies exist in most cases, but they are not always obvious. The next slide. Carleton College was founded by a group of clergy and business people in 1866. I want to discuss the history of heating and cooling systems that make it possible for us to provide an education in Minnesota where temperatures swing by over 120 degrees during the year. Our story begins in 1909 with the inauguration of Carleton's third president, Donald Cowling. The campus at that time consisted of seven buildings, each independently heated uh, by furnace, by fireplaces and boilers, and somewhat haphazardly grouped. The first campus plan that we have in record is from 1910. To the next slide. It was clear that this plan for 15 buildings would require more infrastructure. And the very first building that President Colling built in 1910 was a central heating plant. That central heating plant required 10 tons of coal a day to serve the original seven buildings and use high pressure steam to send heat around the campus. Cowling went on to develop more elaborate plans, next slide, and to build out the campus, adding 11 major buildings, including five dormitories, um, and go on to the next slide. And um, two academic buildings, a chapel, the gymnasium, the field house, uh, all until 1929 when all buildings stopped after the depression. Interestingly, President Cowling published several plans in the 20s and continued to evolve his planning and thinking. But every building he built during that entire time used the first heating plant. All of that was a long-term bet on steam and coal. 
and they built a utility system, a tunnel system that also supported this campus development. After the war, uh, first war, and then the beginning of the second war, the central boilers were converted to natural gas. And when building finally resumed around the end of the 40s, then President Gould had a completely different campus plan and very different building types, but he continued to expand on and rely on that same steam heating infrastructure to serve the campus, adding more tunnels, serving more buildings. This central high pressure steam infrastructure still heats the campus today, though internally buildings often use different standards for hot water. You may have a similar experience with your campus, but it's helpful to reflect on this 100 year history of an investment in the central heating infrastructure of the campus. These developments come about through administration and trustee willingness to invest in planned campus future, we're on the next slide, that could be integrated and efficient. While specific campus plans changed, a common question was how to balance present needs with future capacity and campus growth. There are two big questions in this. First, trading off to the next slide, spending more or less in the present to be more or less efficient in the future. How do we make such a trade-off? Second key aspect is finding efficiencies with lasting value. In 1910, central steam heating was a desirable alternative for several reasons. The logistics of centralized coal supply and ash removal were much easier, and fire hazards were greatly reduced compared to the distributed alternative. Moreover, electricity was very nascent at that time, and steam could be distributed around campus without using electricity for pumping. Today, we ask a similar question. What technology should we bet on with confidence? Where are the efficiencies and the opportunities that will serve us for the next 20 to 50 years or more? I recite this brief history because I find it sobering in our planning for the next major utility investments. How do we design and choose an infrastructure that will last 50 or even 100 years? and be expandable and adaptable as campus plans change and technologies evolve. Next slide. In 2004, our president Odeen commissioned Carleton's first commercial grade wind turbine, which was the first to be owned and operated by a college or university in the US. This was a bold initiative that would begin the next utility planning cycle. In 2007, next slide, we undertook a utility master plan because our growth uh, of space was predicted to outstrip the heating plant capacity. And the resulting plan contemplated replacing our aging heating boilers with larger boilers and upgraded and new steam distribution lines to carry the larger load. Ironically, while the 2007 utility plan proposed adding steam boilers, Carleton at the same time signed the American College and University Climate Commitment, which I know many of those on the phone today are also signatories of setting a long-term goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Next slide. The Climate Action Plan Committee of faculty, staff, and students, supported, of course, by a consultant, examined many options shown here, like building retrofits, campus conservation efforts, new fuel types, even crazy things like, uh, I think on there somewhere is a small campus nuclear support, which was just in the mix. The campus, um, clearly is not going to do all those things, but in May of 2011, um, the board adopted the Climate Action Plan, which is on the next slide. Um, the uh, Climate Action Plan acknowledged that things would change and laid out a timeline for us to get to climate neutrality, here shown as a straight line to 2050. And each of these slices were slices of things that we imagined back in 2007 and then 2011, that would be ways in which that might be possible, some of which are to be determined. Also in 2011, then President Poskanzer initiated a campus-wide strategic planning process. The trustees were involved, working side by side with faculty and staff uh, on each of these subcommittees. Next slide. And after a year and a half of effort, the proposed strategic plan was adopted by the full board in 2012. This plan for so foresaw a continued focus on residential undergraduate liberal arts with no growth in enrollment and selective investment in strategic areas. Following the strategic plan, President Poskanzer then initiated, next slide, a facilities master plan process, which was able to plan facilities and utilities based on the expressed strategic goals, rather than just extrapolations of past performance. Subsequent capital campaign facilities goals was then reduced and focused on two, science and music. 
and both included large replacement pieces. In 2016, nine years after the previous utility plan, we finished work on a second utility master plan. We're on the next slide, which would now also focus on renewal and replacement rather than significant growth. Building on the strategies, um, building on these strategies that we now outlined in both the climate action plan and strategic plan and the facilities plan, the utility master plan was able to be much more specific. The utility plaster plan of 2016 could not be more different than the one from 27. The two plans uh, are most significantly different in the amount of space that they forecast being built and their views of required heating capacity. Instead of building bigger heating systems, we were able to focus on building better, more efficient systems. This illustrates another key point that I want to emphasize in today's talk. Next slide. Long-term goals are important, but Alternatives evaluated in the context of informed, thoughtful prioritization can lead to different trade-offs. We're actually on the next slide now. This is the one about the, comparing the two plans. There we go. Um, and a need, prioritization and a need to consider different early assumptions, reconsider assumptions. As we see through our history, plans evolve and the future is often different from what was imagined. So we need to be able to reevaluate and adapt our plans and bring our infrastructure with us. For us, a major recent development shown on the next slide was the beginning of planning for our new science building. <clears throat> Under the 2007 Utilities Master Plan, the prospect of a new science building was one of the reasons we needed to expand the heating and cooling plant. In 2014, when we came to design that science building, we charged the architects in their contract to design a science addition and renovation that would operate with what we called a net zero additional energy use. This meant that the new expanded building would have to have an energy budget at no bigger than or smaller than the existing buildings that were smaller than what we anticipated. Faculty were supportive of this in the face of architects pushback because of the trade-off between building mechanical systems or building program space. While the architects and faculty were busy planning that new science building, we took the same approach with central utilities. Whoops, you got ahead of me now. Um, how could we address the need for updated facilities? Um, sorry, I can't keep back going back and forth here. How could we address the need for updated facilities, replacing 100-year-old equipment and piping, and at the same time, significantly reduce both the carbon footprint and our ongoing operating costs? We didn't want to find just small reductions. We were really hoping for something much bigger than even 10% to the 20 or 30% range. The guiding principle we came to focus on was we don't need just different fuel types. We need to completely get off of steam, as steam is an inefficient energy source to create and costly to distribute. We had previously evaluated geothermal systems for the library or the data center as a standalone. We pushed our design engineers now to think bigger. The trustees were very adamant that we would not spend money to reduce carbon in ways that were not reasonably economical, and the Climate Action Plan did not want to purchase carbon offsets and avoid changes to the campus. In the end, we chose as the centerpiece of our new plan a campus-wide geothermal heating and cooling plant with large well fields under the central campus lawns and athletic field. Now we're on the next slide. The core of this strategy is a bet on electricity. It is adaptable, abundant, and getting cheaper. And this enabled an alternative to steam, low temperature hot water as a transport medium instead of steam. And it is further enhanced by viewing the earth as a renewable heat source and heat sink rather than using the atmosphere. These allowed us to achieve the main principles we sought. We would get off steam and improve efficiencies. I can talk more in the questions and answers about these specific choices if that's helpful to you. With a campus-wide approach, we then can size the components to be efficient, taking the whole campus into account, not just looking at one building at a time. Here on the next slide, we see the energy profile of the campus. Obviously, in Minnesota, we have a very large heating load, but we also have a large cooling load in the summertime, and we have some load that persists over the entire year. How can we address this load 
with its peaks. Looking at that big picture, we decided to scale our systems in what we would call a hybrid design. If you go to the next slide. We sized the geothermal system so that where in the middle, we can take advantage of simultaneous heating and cooling. We can run that system almost continuously and use both sides of the output, the most efficient operation possible. Then we would use the geothermal system for heating up to a certain size. And then we would have hot water boilers uh, for heating above that for peak loads. Similarly, on the cooling side, we can run the geothermal system for cooling. And when we get to a cooling load beyond which we think it's efficient to operate that, we will have small chillers to take over that peaking. And these also give us redundancy as we need redundancy in Minnesota and anywhere where heating and cooling are really required. As the science building then came to a conclusion, the final approach that they designed was actually to replace an existing building and add 50,000 square feet while renovating the two remaining buildings. Those renovations include new and rebuilt mechanical systems. And the net now is not just the same energy budget, but an actual reduction in the energy use for this new 50,000 foot expanded science complex compared to the current science complex. The second wind turbine was installed in 2011 and serves the campus directly and is a key source of electricity going forward for us. While that turbine serves the grid, a recent initiative by Excel allows us to recapture energy credits from the first turbine as well. So we now have the energy from two turbines effectively serving the campus. We're also tracking the carbon footprint of the regional electrical grid shown here for Excel. It is presently 50% derived from nuclear, wind, and hydro. As Excel, our energy provider, adds solar and wind and removes coal-fired plants, the carbon footprint of our purchased electricity goes down as well. With our electrical, electric geothermal heat pumps, this greener grid will have a significant impact on our overall carbon reduction goal, a point which we discussed with trustees and agreed to use in our climate action plan. In February of this year, the board approved moving forward to construct the science project on the next slide and phase one of the utility master plan. The 24 that you can see here, the new heating plant that's gonna be underneath the science building. Phase one of the utility plan, which is $24 million, will allow us to build this geothermal plant and to convert the east half of the campus to low temperature hot water. Phase two will convert the west half of the campus and interconnect the new systems, now on the next slide, and turn off the steam boilers for good. When phase three would then add more electrical generation. The overall impact of these would be a significant reduction as shown on the next slide. 30% in our carbon for, for scope one and scope two, and a 40 to 45% overall reduction in our plant operating costs. We think this has an 18 or so year payback compared to the alternative of repairing and replacing our current steam boilers. The well drillers are now on campus and the geothermal plant is under construction, under contract and construction is beginning. As I hope to have made clear, our planning and project designs improved over a long decade of dialogue and exploration. The convergence of a new strategic plan, an aging infrastructure, and our desire to reduce carbon emissions gave us the impetus to look again at our options in a bigger picture. The result is a campus-wide plan with much better cost and carbon reductions, and a new infrastructure that we believe will be the best, most robust technology platform for future expansion, efficiency, and flexibility. In closing, I have a few observations here on the next slide. Oops, the next slide. Um, the first is about mentoring and guidance. This is a very gentle process. The strategic plan and the climate action plan both set out directions and staff and consultants had to try to find ways to achieve those goals within the financial capacity of the college. The trade-offs and opportunities were explored and the answers weren't always obvious, but as we discussed and interpreted these for the campus and the board, they were refined over time with everyone's input. The new utility master plan is the result of a lot of iterative evaluation and input. Still, we kept the essential vision throughout, which is we're trying to make Carleton more competitive financially and academically. Second is that order matters because planning is iterative and cumulative. The first utility plan was driven by the need to grow our square footage and to deal with the aging steam plant. After the strategic plan and the climate action plan, 
the goals for the college changed and were clearer, and that enabled us to design a more integrated campus infrastructure that reflected different goals for sustainability and growth. Third is the big picture thinking is really required. Even when we're focused on trying to solve small practical problems in front of us, we find it's increasingly important to be able to step back and look at the larger picture and repeat for ourselves those questions that we started with. What are we really trying to accomplish? What are our major alternatives? Have we thought of those and are we exploring them in ways that are the most innovative for the campus? That goes to the next point, which is about slowing down. The science building had been the push to expand our utility infrastructure over a decade ago, and instead it became the push to reimagine it. Being willing to slow down and look more broadly let us develop better solutions. It gave us time to visit other sites and collect more data. From those visits to other campuses and our subsequent conversations and debates, we came to better understand our options and priorities. And the hybrid design and that we, we came to and strategies for emerging, for improving our energy performance were worth the time we think we put into them. Trustees gave us the space to do this exploration and to consider it carefully. When we're building on a time scale of 50 to 100 years, we think it is worth being patient and very thoughtful. Finally, big bets are inherent. There always are going to be big bets, big bets that have a long time scale to pay off. As we focus on low temperature hot water, we had extensive discussions and debate about whether this would serve us well and what would we be giving up and how could we reduce the cost and risk. We settled on that in the end because for one, we don't have to convert the whole campus at once. For two, we can reuse large parts of it, including we're going to reuse the steam tunnels. And for three, we think it has many alternative inputs, solar thermal, geothermal, other kinds of heating technologies that'll come along all of these more efficient heating technologies work to lower high temperatures. So the lower we can set that temperature for the campus standard, the wider our alternatives are in the future, we believe. We came to understand this plan and bet on it, and we're able to explain it in the end to the campus and the trustees. But even then, risk remains, and the trustees and we all felt comfortable understanding what we do and knowing that there still remain some risks. I hope this experience is helpful. <clears throat> I hope it stimulates your thinking, and I hope it helps motivate you to look at your own circumstance and find out where your alternatives and opportunities lie. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fred. Um, so if people have any questions about uh, the examples that Fred gave or the experience from Carlton, uh, please enter them into the chat box and we'll make sure to include them in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. So now I'd like to transition to David from Greener U to hear some of your insight. David, take it away. Thanks, Ruby. Um, we can uh, start right on the next slide. Uh, yeah, just briefly, Greener U is a uh, company headquartered in Watertown, Massachusetts. We're a mission-driven company uh, motivated by helping colleges and universities uh, in their efforts to combat climate change. On the next slide, a brief summary of, um, uh, of the company. We, we deal with the whole spectrum of building efficiency. Our tagline is, is engineering campus sustainability uh, because we've got staff to handle the hardware side of mechanical engineering and project management as well as the software side. Uh, we feel that the range of these services gives us a distinct perspective on navigating the complexities of academic institutions. Um, on to uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, Fred's talk was, was interesting and, and got to a lot of specifics. I'm going to uh, take it up a little bit and talk about some concepts. Um, and talk about the psychology of risk, uh, the value of an investment mindset, and we will get very briefly into uh, a case study uh, the Worcester Polytechnic Institute that uh, exemplifies some of these principles and uh, then try to uh, squeeze in enough time for questions at the end. So first, um, I'd like to talk about psychology of risk. Um, on the next slide, we've got uh, a graphic that demonstrates hyperbolic, hyperbolic discount, uh, which is defined as the propensity to increasingly prefer a sooner reward at a lower value uh, rather than 
equate to the value of that reward to increase or cashing in on it. Um, this concept is also sometimes known as present bias. Uh, I hope the graphic gets the point across. The blue line represents uh, a smaller reward when accepted sooner, and the red line represents uh, a larger reward accepted later. Now, discounting is rational. We do it to account for the cost of money and for uncertainty about the future. But what this graphic uh, communicates is that um, when the two options are far off in the future, you think uh, place yourself all the way over on the left end of the y axis on the y axis in time. Um, we discount rationally. Uh, you know, say when two options are 10 years and 11 years off, respectively. Um, as we move closer to the time of the first option, say uh, all the way up to um, one day before the opportunity for the smaller reward, and 366 days before the uh, larger reward, there's still a one year gap, um, but we place a much higher value uh, on the more immediate reward. Um, whereas from a rational perspective, uh, the, the relative value of those rewards hasn't changed. Um, uh, you know, so why do we why do we do this? Why do we disproportionately discount future value? Um, you know, one reason is that it's easier to relate to more immediate rewards than to distant potential rewards. Uh, I can relate much more easily to the immediate satisfaction of eating a bacon cheeseburger uh, than I can to the increased long-term risk of heart disease. Uh, put another way, it's a lot easier for me to say, uh, you know, I understand those risks, um, and I'm not going to eat any more bacon cheeseburgers uh, a year from now. But uh, um, you know, it's it's easier for me to say no to that uh, that bacon cheeseburger a year down the road than it is for me to uh, say no to the one the opportunity to have one right now. Uh, institutionally, we're uh, we're facing a um, similar type of decision. Uh, we're facing competing immediate priorities. Uh, and limited resources to address them. Uh, accounting for far off future benefits um, that are going to accrue in many cases long after we're gone uh, just doesn't feel like a luxury that, that we can afford. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you know, it's easy to get caught up in trying, trying to factor in all the variables before making decisions on a big project. Uh, to obsess about nailing down cost estimates to the penny, to insist on the most rigorous engineering analysis of potential benefits, etc. cetera. Uh, but the result of that is often inaction, which actually can have huge costs. You know, it's important to keep a level of clarity about which questions need to be answered thoroughly now, and which ones require only a broad brush answer. Uh, now, with details to come later. Now, we make decisions all the time based on some set of assumptions about the future. There's inherently some risk that those assumptions will not bear out. And this is where human nature and our tendency to weigh some types of risks more heavily than others can undermine a good decision. We're, uh, we're much more averse to risk associated with our actions than to risk associated with inaction. I would call that inaction bias. Uh, as an example, in my profession, I've seen many retrofit projects stall based on some lack of certainty about the future. The building might get demolished in 10 years, so we don't have clarity on what our energy prices are going to look like uh, five, 10 years down the road. Uh, the impulse not to act is based on the premise that it'd be unwise to invest in systems that might be taken out of service several years down the road or might not otherwise pay for themselves, which you know is not unsound thinking, but uh, but those risks are rarely weighed evenly against the lost opportunity associated with inaction, um, lost energy savings, the lost maintenance savings, the, uh, lost opportunity to improve the built environment and improve the experience of the users of the building. Um, yeah, it often feels uh, it's often easier and feels safer not to not to act than to act. Um, and there's no shortage of rationalizations we can provide ourselves. And to others uh, to justify inaction, but even though it feels safer, inaction is often not the best course. Uh, next slide. That bias uh, can lead to poor risk management and poor decisions. 
we place much greater stock in the threat of lost investment than we do in lost savings. Another term for behavioral economists is loss aversion. Um, ideally, decisions would be made on the best available information, recognizing the benefit of waiting for perfect information about the future and never act. Um, being cognizant that these biases are baked into the psychology, not only of our own decision making, but of our institutional decision making. Can equip us to overcome these biases and uh, and make better decisions for the long run. I've probably seen some version of the graph on the next slide. Um, it's from sight lines and it shows the distribution of buildings on college campuses uh, by construction age and renovation age. According to their data, we're, we're reaching a critical point where existing buildings are in dire need of attention. This is a consequence primarily of the, uh, the baby boom inspired building boom. I'll try to say that three times fast. But uh, um, the, the baby boom inspired building boom on campuses in the 60s and 70s, um, uh, as a result of those, those buildings sort of hitting uh, middle age, if you will, we need to tend, uh, uh, we need to spend a lot more resources tending to them. Um, but this creates an opportunity as well. We're going to be, uh, out of necessity, we're going to be investing significantly in those buildings in the decades to come. And as those mid century buildings get updated uh, and we modernize them for the 21st century, we can either make our decisions based on short sighted and narrowly considered payback criteria or immediate budgetary criteria, or we can take the opportunity to make our buildings better stations better spaces, better spaces in which to learn, to teach, to live, uh, while we demonstrate responsible stewardship of our campuses and our planet. Um, as we think about energy efficiency and greenhouse gas mitigation efforts on campuses, we need to do this hand in glove with efforts to make our spaces better learning environments. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more as we a few slides on. But um, uh, on the next slide, we can start talking about how we get there. Uh, adopting an investment mindset uh, is one tool that, that can help uh, make the decisions that are more optimal in the long term. Campus infrastructure represents the, the greatest financial assets of, of our institutions, exceeding the endowment of the wealthiest schools. Uh, we need to start thinking of these as assets and managing them as assets like uh, we would an investment portfolio. Um, you know, it's not news, I don't think, to any of us that we, we should strive to think long term and, and uh, you know, incorporate the long term consequences into our decision making uh, as much as possible. But as we've seen from uh, some of the earlier slides, uh, immediate concerns tend to tend to get much more attention. Um, it's difficult to focus on long term uh, when it seems so far off. Uncertain and abstract, what the immediate future is staring us in the face. Uh, but the benefits of keeping our eye on long term impacts can be substantial. Uh, another gem from Sightlines here uh, this quote uh, is from a 2015 study that found that over time, a dollar in stewardship affords $3 in future capital minimum investment. Stewardship referring to proactively caring for facilities, i.e., thinking long term, as opposed to reactively addressing deferred maintenance, um, and waiting for things to break. Uh, you know, there's, um, but there's also an accountability gap uh, that tips the scales in favor of the short term. Uh, capital costs get much more scrutiny than long term cost impact uh, of those capital costs, uh, capital spending decisions. Project costs are scrutinized and capital budgets are diligently managed, but no one's held accountable for long term cost impacts of, of project decisions with nearly the same rate. Um, as a result, we often rue the decisions made in value engineering processes, which uh, is usually a misnomer for what really goes on, but a process that's usually designed to um, you know, well, figure out how to. Stick with our existing budgets, often at the expense of the long term. Um, when we're making a case for long term 
how to present the information matters. This is a, an example from a project we worked on recently. Um, looking at the numbers the way we've got them here, uh, you know, neither option was terribly appealing. Obviously, the 14 year payback uh, was a bit more attractive, both from an energy savings standpoint uh, and, and from a payback standpoint. But in most cases, without a uh, uh, a compelling reason above and beyond the financials presented here, that project's um, not going to get the green light. If you look at life cycle costs, uh, you see, looking a little further down the table, uh, you see that option B saves you to uh, click one once more, please thank you. Uh, option B saves $700,000 in terms of net present value. Uh, but what does that really mean? Um, you know, in my experience, financial people get the concept of net present value, but it doesn't really resonate, and it's not usually uh, the basis of uh, big financial decisions. Looking down a little further, on uh, if you look at the internal rate of return, now we're starting to talk about the big say on that slide a moment. But, um, uh, now we're speaking the language of investment. Um, let me go back one slide, please. Um, you know, a 10 a ten percent return should at least open the door uh, to, to further conversation. And, you know, taking that concept even one step further, uh, a number of schools are starting to look at the social cost of carbon and account that uh, account for that in their decision making. Um, Yale University from Done this in a very public fashion. We've had a lot of good information about, about their program. They value the carbon at forty dollars a metric ton. If we include that valuation in our analysis, now option B is up to eleven point two percent return on investment, and maybe to a place where we can start to get some traction. Um, now the next slide. Um, but all that financial information is still talking primarily about energy. Energy only accounts for approximately 1% of the cost associated with operating our institutions. Um, so ownership and operation of the buildings accounts for another 9%. Um, both of these items are dwarfed by the human activities, the educational activities that go on in those buildings, which account for 90% of the cost structure. Um, these figures are general, uh, you know, they're going to vary from institution to institution. But, uh, the point is that the value of the educational and research activities that happen in our buildings towards the cost of owning and operating and maintaining those buildings. Um, this is a bit of a, uh, an eye opener for me. Uh, I've been doing energy efficiency work for 25 plus years, and, and to see it broken down this way and realize that I uh, focused on the 1% piece of the pie was, uh, was a little humbling. Um, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, it makes the challenges that we're facing seem a bit more surmountable. That 1% uh, sliver of the cost structure is responsible for the majority of our institutions' greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, you know, I'm optimistic that we can find, uh, find solutions to those, those challenges without breaking the bank. Um, next slide, please. Not only should that be easy to tackle, but uh, these two quotes from sessions I attended at the uh, Second Nature Summit this winter really drove home for me how important it is to the core mission uh, of our educational institutions that we take this on and that we do it well. Um, both these quotes came in the context of discussing sustainability initiatives and campus operations, and the, uh, you know, the, the first one really resonated with really teaching through the course of institutional example. Um, so uh, not only is the, the cost associated with the majority of campus emissions a tiny sliver of the cost of running the institutions on the next slide, please, uh, but addressing those carbon emissions is an important component of how we educate our students for teaching through the course of institutional example. Um, unfortunately, this is Entirely out of sync with um, 
conversations happen on most campuses about addressing greenhouse gas emissions from existing buildings. So far too many of those conversations are focusing on short paybacks and requests for low hanging fruit and not taking a look at the big picture. Uh, on the next slide, uh, what we do with our buildings can have enormous impacts uh, on the productivity of individuals working in those buildings. And these are uh, just some. Uh, some efforts pulled from some various research that, that shows how uh, ventilation uh, and temperature impact uh, productivity, uh, in productivity in the learning environment, and uh, the thought of the, the effectiveness of the students' abilities to absorb information, professors' abilities to create and convey that information, etc. So as we address energy use in our buildings, we have to pay at least as much attention to the impacts on the occupants as we do the impacts on energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, those occupants are going to get the biggest bang for their buck when they invest in better functioning buildings. On the next slide, uh, putting this all together, climate change and its effects uh, will be the, the single biggest issue facing current students in their lifetimes. Uh, we have to do a better job of tying efforts to reduce energy and greenhouse gas emissions together with efforts to uh, make buildings more hospitable for working, studying, and living, and, and ultimately tying those efforts to the education mission of uh, Conversely, um, if we are a teaching group or some institutional example, as I quoted earlier, um, what are we? What are we teaching when we make decisions based on narrow payback criteria without serious consideration of the impact on what goes on in our buildings, uh, what, uh, what's going to happen in those buildings, and what their carbon footprint is going to be over the next 50 years? On to the next slide, I'm um, going to uh, take a quick look at a, uh, a real life example. Uh, an institution that uh, has, uh, has moved beyond the payback mentality and really has integrated long term investment mentality into their decision making. Um, so, uh, if you could, on the, the next slide, uh, you, you know, talk about that's fine. Uh, WPI uh, has really done done a great job, and I particularly want to call out um, Bill Spratt, their director of facilities operations, and Jeff Solomon, their CFO, who have led the charge on these efforts. Um, briefly, for context, WPI is uh, is located in Worcester, Massachusetts. was founded in 1865, uh, and today serves about uh, 6,000 students on a 95 acre campus. In 2012, with a nudge from Synergy Worcester, which was a program that Greenview uh, developed in collaboration with uh, National Grid for Local Utility, WPI, and a couple other colleges in the area, um, WPI really reevaluated their approach to energy efficiency and began a program of investing in their uh, existing buildings. And you see on this slide the results uh, uh, of that investment program they, they've gotten. They've achieved amazing results. They, uh, they're getting an attractive return, a uh, greater return on that investment of about 18%. Um, on the next slide, though, I want to talk specifically uh, and briefly about um, one of the many projects we did on that campus. Uh, Goddard Hall was uh, a teaching lab built in 1965. Um, so we had some interesting challenges working in that building path to reducing its energy use by 53%. Um, after thinking we had completed our work in the building, we noticed that we were falling far short of the estimated energy savings. Uh, and so our engineering team uh, kept digging. Uh, and after further investigation found uh, that there was excessive air leakage in the main air handling system. Um, we did a little research on this and ended up undertaking an innovative approach to sealing the ducts from within, um, and uh, which was 
an interesting project and something to talk about in and of itself. But uh, uh, it was a key component to us uh, getting to that 53% energy reduction. But uh, more importantly, for the first time in memory, that building has been working correctly, you know, delivering the right amount there, properly heated, you know, provide properly heated, cool, ventilated environment uh, in these teaching labs. Um, and you know, based on all the all the things we were saying earlier, uh, you know, I would ask how much is that worth, and what's the uh, what's the rate of return on that investment? Um, I think it's uh, it's hard to quantify, but it's not easy. Uh, we can flip through the two slides here. Um, just very briefly, we're proud to note that WPI was recently awarded uh, a gold rating in the STARS program. Uh, they have a comprehensive sustainability plan that integrates research and academics with campus operations. So, and all of this translates to deeper engagement and more integrated approach, uh, where sustainability has really become part of the campus culture. So, I would just uh, call out again that uh, WPI is an example of a school that moved beyond simple payback mentality to uh, an investment mentality. Uh, and it's now easier for them to make the case uh, to their relevant stakeholders that energy efficient infrastructure makes sense and produces other benefits. Um, wrapping up, um, I would just like to uh, sort of circle back and uh, click through to the next couple. Slides here. Uh, reflect back one uh, on Fred's presentation. For the next slide, please. Um, as uh, you know, as, as Fred said, long-range planning and looking at the big picture are, are not easy, but they're crucial. Um, when we're making big decisions, we need to think ahead, fifty to hundred years in many cases, and envision how the campus is going to change. Uh, we made decisions based on current circumstances. Uh, pardon the cliche, we were skating to where the puck has been rather than where it's going. Um, and second, we need to think creatively about how to align facilities goals with the mission of the school. Um, you know, start the conversation focusing on educational opportunities uh, and, uh, and how we can integrate with Education mission and uh, emphasize that over energy and cost impacts. Not that they not an important part of the conversation, but uh, the educational component first. Um, we need to adopt an investment mindset. Um, talked about uh, the power of talking about internal rate of return rather than talking about paybacks is, uh, is significant. And Fred talked about uh, the, the big moves, um, and we need to look for synergies. And, and in the Carlton case, uh, they, they need to invest in, in more, uh, more steam capacity and cooling capacity, provide the impetus for reimagining their energy infrastructure. If they, if they hadn't seized on that opportunity, it might have been another 50 years before a comparable opportunity presented itself. So, uh, but you know, to, to make the big plays, uh, there are risks, and you uh, really need to understand those risks and evaluate them, um, and do the thing, do the research, uh, and be prepared to counteract the psychology that's going to push you towards uh, suboptimal shorter term decisions. Uh, but future you will be glad, glad that you did. With that, uh, I'm going to wrap up and turn it back over to Ruby. Hopefully, we have a little bit of time left for questions. Thank you, David. Um, so, if folks have questions, you can go ahead and continue entering them into the chat box. Um, so, I will just start with a few questions that we've received so far. Um, so, here's one that I think both Fred and David can speak to. Um, and Fred, I'll give it to you first to talk a little bit about your experience at uh, Carleton. But the question is, how can we influence decision makers to keep sustainability in mind when the sustainability professional isn't in the room? Um, Fred, can you talk about um, any insights from what you did at Carleton? 
Yeah, I think sustainability has to get into the mindset of the whole senior leadership team. So it shouldn't be about one person's agenda. It's the, it's the same as other issues like that, you know, whether they're issues of diversity in the workforce or pay levels or anything else. The, col the whole institution really has to develop a point of view and then it can be worked into the normal work of the college. As I said, sustainability shouldn't be a competitor for investments that are directed at the mission of the college. It needs to become a supporter of that mission. Great. Um, David, do you have any insights from some of the schools that you've worked with? Sure. I mean, this is it's actually a huge question. Um, I mean, ultimately, you're talking about culture change, uh, which is really the objective of sustainability offices across the country, um, trying to get sustainability embedded in the DNA of the institution. Uh, and as, as Fred said, ultimately, that's, that's how you you get sustainability sort of woven into your decision making regardless of whether uh, you're sustainability professionals in the room. Uh, I would add, in, in addition to um, strong direction from senior leadership, uh, inclusive processes in, uh, in establishing your sustainability goals is, is crucial to you know, want to get the, the broadest possible buy um, to uh, help ensure that, that that mindset gets. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, so here is kind of a clarifying question, um, which I'll let you explain, David. So can you explain internal rate of return and how do you calculate it? Yeah, that's, uh, I'll try not to get um, too financial about it, um, but uh, IRR is uh, essentially your your investment return on, on a cash flow sequence. Um, if you invest X dollars now and uh, receive various amounts of cash back over the years, you know, sort of a predictable stream or, or a varying stream, um, IRR is a calculation to figure out what the implied interest rate is on that investment. Um, and, it's, uh, and how you do it is uh, basically there's, there's a function in Excel sheets that uh, that allows you to line up a, a cash flow sequence and um, and evaluate what their what the rate of return is on that um, uh, and it's really the same calculation your uh, your brokerage account or investment advisor or whatever uh, is providing when they say uh, whether it's on your 401k you know looks at what, what the return has been over five years ten years um, that's an IRR calculation. Um, just well, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, won't, I won't get too much into details. So I'm happy to explain that in more detail uh, if someone wants to email me or call me afterwards. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question that um, I think maybe Fred, you can speak to a little bit. So the question is, do you look at payback period or impact to cash flow? in terms of financing when making decisions on project viability. So I know you did talk a little bit about um, payback period, but I wonder if you could just go into a little bit more depth about how you decide what projects to implement and what metrics, um, you know, as a school kind of most interested in. Yeah, um, well, we have different criteria, I guess I would say, for some of these different projects. Smaller projects where we're, t we're doing things like replacing lighting and controls and upgrading heating systems and mechanical equipment. Uh, we do look at uh, IRR, as David was explaining, and returns. And we would probably prioritize those in the order of the best returns or sometimes in the order of the opportunity. That is, we're going to renovate this building anyway. So when we're doing that, we should do this as a part of that. It might be something that we otherwise would have done later, but we'll do it at that time because that's the opportunity to take it into the project and do it at a lower cost than if we did it as a standalone project. But then there are some projects like this big one that I talked about that really are kind of a once in a generation project. We're either gonna replace the steam boilers as we have them or we're gonna do something else. And as David said, once we do that, uh, you know, we're done, that's our decision. If we replace steam boilers 10 years ago, they're gonna have another life of 30 or 40 years and we're not gonna wanna replace them yet again. 
So in that case, we look at kind of the longer term issues. And here we took a, a willingly a lower rate of return for what we think is a much longer term bet on the future of the college. Um, so I guess I would say for smaller, sort of more opportunistic projects, there's certainly a higher bar than there is for some of these that are structural and that are more strategic and fundamental. Great. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So um, this one, I'll give uh, first to David and then to Fred. I think both of you can speak to this. So the question is, are there any obvious mistakes uh, 50 years ago that you still see building managers or engineers make today? And then what would you do differently? So um, quickly first, David. Um, so the biggest mistakes we're, we're still making, um, you know, uh, as I alluded to in the presentation, I think the biggest mistakes are coming in the value engineering process. Uh, a term that I don't like, but yeah, often what we set out with the, uh, the best intentions on these projects and we design, um, we design systems more or less the, the way they should be and then we find that we can't afford them. Um, uh, and what I see happening a lot in those, uh, in those processes to try to get get those uh, capital cost budgets back under controls. A lot of controls functionality and zoning capability uh, is getting cut from projects at the last minute. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, frankly, we end up doing projects going back into those buildings um, uh, 10, 10 years down the road, and it's, it's going to cost four to five times as much to retrofit that capability back into the building um, if it is going to get done. 10 years down the road, and, and if, uh, uh, if it's going to be left as it was valued and value engineered for the next 50 years, uh, you're, you're significantly compromising the functionality of the building. I think a lot of the older mistakes of, um, uh, you know, around building envelope and the like have uh, been improved a great deal with, uh, with our current construction practices. Hopefully, we won't see quite as much uh, trouble. And um, Fred, from the CFO perspective, are there any mistakes that you're still seeing happening and, and anything that you would recommend to do differently? Well, I think the theme is the same, this idea of being somewhat short-sighted. Um, I think it takes really, you know, I said earlier, the sustainability issue has to be imbued in the senior team. It also takes an advocate for it in the senior team. I think it's hard to convince people if they're all really taking a very short-term view. But this longer-term view on behalf of the institution, I think, is so essential and really trying to figure out where the balances are on that. And there will be trade-offs and there will be some things that one may not be able to do perfectly. But on the whole, these are institutions that expect to have a very long life. And so we're expecting to try to get things in place. And as I like to say to the campus, we're working today to make the long-term operating cost of the college as low as possible. So we're making investments and we're making changes. And we're trying to adopt strategies that will do that over time. Probably an example where this didn't happen that illustrates that is the very building my office is in is an old building built in 1905. It was not air conditioned when it was built. It was heated by that steam plant originally. Now it's heated by hot water. But it has inside the building chilled water that serves one wing of the building because the president's office at one point wanted air conditioning. And so we brought in central chilled water and served that part of the building. The other part of the building, we have split systems. So we have little outside condensing units that serve office suites because those office suites wanted to be done and their budgets couldn't afford extending the central chilled water. And then up in some of the offices upstairs, we even have window air conditioning units. So all in the same building, we have all three types of air conditioning where it really should have been, in my opinion, done from the beginning with a vision that says, if that's a building we're gonna air condition, then put in the infrastructure to do it right the first time. And it would be much cheaper to operate today if we had the whole building on central chilled water. But we didn't and we haven't made those decisions. And there are decisions like that on every campus where people are making suboptimal, let's do this single project as cheaply as possible. Uh, but in the long run, it runs up the operating costs and maintenance costs for the college. And we all need to try to be aware of that. We need advocacy to try to overcome that. But I'd say none of us are gonna be perfect at it. Great, thank you. So it sounds like long-term vision and planning are uh, 
the major theme for today. So we're out of time, and I just wanted to, um, again, extend a huge thank you to Fred and David for this conversation. Um, thanks also to everyone who joined today. This is a, as a reminder, we'll be posting the recording on our website. Um, you can feel free to email us with follow-up questions. Um, thanks, everyone.